Joining me to debate, is the NHS fit for purpose? Our GPs, Dr Ken Aswani and Dr Mike Smith. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Ken, I'll start with you. Uh, were you surprised to see these Ipsos Mori polls? You know, 26% do not believe the NHS uh, is fit for purpose. 41% are critical of how non-COVID care is being handled. Uh, given the lack of public debate, they're quite big numbers, aren't they? Yes, they are big numbers, and I'm not surprised. I mean, part of it is that we are in the middle of a, a pandemic in, in the sense that, you know, there is a degree of prioritisation, but also it's the messages that sort of go out, because certainly we noticed much more at the beginning of the pandemic, patients were staying away, and ultimately, you know, their, their, their diagnoses and their presentation was delayed. Now, the message going out, your symptoms are urgent, the NHS is open, they should seek um, sort of attention as, as soon as possible, whether it's an emergency or a serious symptom suggesting cancer or your long-term condition. Um, so um, the, I, I think that uh, the NHS is, is working fully and it's important that you know patients do access um, and we make sure we're, we're managing the cases that we actually want. Um, what we what we what we want to do is to make sure that we we continue to do that. I think the NHS will catch up, um, but I think it does have to juggle the pandemic uh, for the time being, and I think that's the challenge really. Um, well, Ken, but it's definitely you know, Ken. You say that patients were staying away, uh, but actually, one of the big criticisms has been that a lot of patients, uh, and perhaps slightly older patients, it may well be said wanted to have face-to-face -face appointments with their GPs, they couldn't get them. And perhaps another reason people weren't coming to doctors and hospitals, uh, A&Es in the numbers that perhaps they might, is they feared catching COVID in hospital. And I was looking this morning at the numbers, the COVID cases in hospital in London, and a third of those people went into London hospitals without COVID, but contracted it there. So uh, you can see for both of those reasons, uh, perhaps why... Uh, to quote it back at you, people stayed away. Yeah, so so in terms of sort of primary care GP consultations, um, a lot of GPs vet the consultation remotely, and if the patient needs a face-to-face, -face -face, they, they do organise that. That's partly to reduce the risk, but making sure those that do need face-to-face -face do actually get that. What's happened around the COVID, uh, COVID situation that a lot of services are provided remotely in the patient's home, so we have geriatricians, we have rapid response to actually go to the patient's home to give them care rather than have the risk of COVID by going into hospital. And that may be, actually be a model in the future because we know that hospital, although they provide a great service, um, there is a risk of catching um, well, infection, particularly yeah, viral infection to COVID. And there's a balance how we provide care. I mean, we always use the term care close to home. Uh, and that's actually is a, a valid principle because at home you, you are you are safe but you do need care to come come to your door i think well again i don't doubt there are some people younger busier people with jobs who need you know repeat prescriptions and for them an online consultation is fine and i get that and if that takes the pressure off gp services in the future that will be one good thing that may come through it uh, mike smith um even before covid hit the waiting list the nhs waiting list was over five million so if we just sort of almost forget this pandemic happened and go back to where we were before it, um, there were no critical voices. Any, as I said, anybody in the public sphere that criticised the way things were being run tended to get shouted down. Was that equally true within the medical profession? I think so. I think that, um, you know, I love the NHS. I, I really do. My mum was in it for 40 years before I was in it, and I've been in it for, since 1995. But one thing you can't do is say there's anything wrong with it because it's yeah. immediately uh, perceived as a criticism of the hardworking people within it and the excellent services it provides when it can provide it. But unless, unless we're really honest with ourselves, and I put it to any doctor or nurse or healthcare professional that can say, do you think you can refer to a specialist in a timely fashion? Because someone can get their hip replacement yeah. in under a year. Do you think it's easy to make an appointment with a GP, remote or otherwise, the answer is no. Now, that's not because the people aren't working hard. That isn't because the people don't care. It's because, unfortunately, the system is flawed. And it hasn't just fallen off a cliff since COVID happened. 
yes, uh, you know, things got worse, but I've seen this gradual decline since I've worked in the NHS. And I've gone from, mm, it can be fixed to, it needs something wholesale now. It, you know, we're just managing failure at the moment. Well, Mike Smith has spoken very strongly there, Ken. Um, and, you know, Boris Johnson telling us we're the envy of the world in terms of our public health system. It's just not true, is it? Because if we look across the English Channel uh, to countries like France and Germany, you know, they actually get better health outcomes on virtually every measure um, and in many cases spend less money. So, Ken, we do need to be a little bit more honest with ourselves about this, don't we? So, so I think the, the issue about, you know, should we have a debate in terms of how we can yeah. improve, I totally agree with that because you, you can never stand still. Um, I think the issue about where does the NHS provide world-class care, we only have to look at heart attack care, stroke care, um, cancer care and so on. Some of the treatments that are provided are really, really genuinely world-class. But the areas that we do need to um, sort of improve on, so say providing integrated care, particularly in terms of our, our elderly, particularly the frail elderly, personalised care in terms of those with long-term conditions, um, with children um, and, and reducing obesity, particularly what we do in, in schools, I think is critical, early diagnosis, um, and being clear in, certain, in terms of medicines, you know, which of the medicines, if they're available over the counter, do we actually prescribe on the NHS? I mean, cosmetic surgery is not available on the NHS, but do we want to be a, clear, a little bit clearer about what is not providing the NHS? There are directions that we need to go that are going to make a difference that is evidence-based from international um, sort of studies. And I think it's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but admitting that we do need to work differently. But a lot of it is upstream. A lot of it is in, in the prevention field, which we've learned a lot from COVID, but we need to do a massive amount. So I don't think it's a situation that it's all about pills and operations. It's what we can do almost to prevent getting ill where we can. We've got a long well, way to go there. Yeah, I understand that fully. And I think one of the criticisms, actually, of the GP sector uh, is they too easily sign pieces of paper and prescribe pills uh, for all sorts of things. Uh, but, Ken, when it comes to preventative medicine... Uh, wouldn't it be true to say that we have a massive obesity problem uh, causing health issues, not just now, but the numbers, the sheer numbers of obese young people, unless something changes, is going to be a, a problem that could overwhelm the NHS a few years down the road? And, and that's where we should have the debate. So, for example, take the schools. I mean, some of the schools have sort of had a programme that you run a mile a day and, and their, their sort of BC levels have dropped as their academic ability has increased. What I couldn't understand is why every school is not doing that. Um, but also to have the open debate of what actually can help in obesity. And that's, you know, certainly looking, looking at, you know, so we had sort of reduced sugar in, in products, but we've not done anything about salt or, or fat in the products that we buy, but also the, the ways we can actually reduce obesity. And if we have that kind of debate, uh, we provide the technique we provide around COVID, then we start mm. tackling some of the huge problems. And, you know, that, that's the kind of thing we need to do because it takes time to get those improvements in place. And we are behind the rest of the country, but, but you know, there's no time sort of sooner than now to, to, to get into that because then it does become difficult for the NHS to pick up the pieces later down the road. Well, I, that's, yeah, the concern I'm expressing there. And, Mike, um, some people have said to me, leave it as it is. Uh, governments over the last 20 years, or 25 years since Blair got in, um, have constantly uh, shaken up the NHS, changed the management models. Uh, the last thing the NHS needs, I'm told, uh, is any more changes in structures. Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, first of all, it's going to undergo a massive change in structure next uh, year in April. Oh, so we're already too late for the massive change in structure. They're having a huge turnaround of it. Um, Is that, the, uh, you know, hence, hence my question, Mike, because some are saying to me that we've had enough changes. We don't need that. What's your response? My response is we either have to put a bucket load more money and way more than you were saying, Nigel, about the things it needs to pay for. Yeah. It's not 10 billion here. We're talking about significant for it. And that's what people need to understand. Do they want to significantly raise taxes? Do they want to find another way of paying for the requirements of a functioning health service? Or do they want to scale back massively what the NHS offers? And the stuff we're mentioning about preventative medicine, unfortunately, falls in the realm of public health, 
which currently doesn't fall within the NHS. It might do in the future, but it doesn't. So, And those programmes take 10, 15, 20 right. years sometimes to see the results. And yes, yeah. they're important. But to answer to your question, is the NHS fit for purpose? I'm, I honestly believe, unless we address those three elephants in the room, no. OK. Finally, very quickly to both of you, uh, we were told, get double vaccinated, all will be well. Then we were told we needed a booster. Now we're being told we need another booster, a fourth jab. Uh, is this taking up just a vast amount of time? And do both of you uh, believe that regular boosters are a good thing? Ken. So, so in my view, I think, you know, this is still a new virus and we're learning all the time. But the evidence does show that, you know, if there is a booster, it does increase your immunity. It may wane over time and there may need to be a fourth booster or an annual booster. And I think we have to ride with that. That's going to be our most effective weapon in yeah. terms of controlling the pandemic. We do want to get to business as usual, but we do want to sort of continue the battle of this. And yes, there may be more boosters, but so far it's the right direction. OK, and Mike, it's going to take up a lot more time, isn't it? It is, but it's probably going to save time in the long run. I mean, you know, look, we know that just from our own personal experience of dealing with yeah. patients day to day, that actually this COVID uh, pandemic, this wave, sorry, does appear to be milder than the previous waves. And we could, and that's probably because of the booster campaign. And if it is, that's great news. So we're probably okay. saving time in the long term.